Thanks very much for joining us today. Um, my name is Mark Hobbs. I'm the Head of Structural Engineering at Premier Composite Technologies and I'm uh, glad to say today we're joined by my very good friend and colleague Gabby Boom, who's the Principal Architect at Premier Composites. And we're going to talk to you today about the use of advanced FRP composites in architecture. Now composite materials are simply materials that are made up of two or more constituents that are put together to form the material. And although they sound very modern, they're actually uh, some of the oldest materials in building are composite materials. So wood is a natural composite of lignin and cellulose. And very early on, people discovered that by adding uh, straw to clay bricks, you could produce bricks which were much stronger and uh, had better resilience than pure clay alone. Well, we're talking in particular about fiber reinforced polymer composites. Now these are materials which are made up of two main constituents. That's a polymer resin system and then uh, reinforcement fibers. And particularly we're talking about uh, advanced FRP composites and these are the materials that Premier Composites specializes in. Now these consist of generally a high performance epoxy resin system and continuous fiber reinforcements. And generally with architectural projects, we're normally looking at using either glass fiber or carbon fiber or a mixture of these for our reinforcements. We also make quite extensive use of cores. These are either structural foam cores or honeycomb cores, which are used to form sandwich structures. And these are very efficient uh, structures, very good at supporting distributed loads, like the pressure loads you get from, from wind loads or live loads on facades and roofs. Now, although they sound like quite uh, new materials, they have been around for quite some time. Epoxy resins were first synthesized in the 1940s, and the uh, A320, which was the first commercial airliner to make extensive use of uh, advanced FRP composites, flew, first flew in 1980. The materials are also highly widely used in a number of other industries, particularly in the marine industry, and the advantages you get here are very similar to the advantages that we, we use in the architectural world. So this is the ability to form very lightweight structures. This is both down to the, the inherent strength and stiffness to weight ratio of the materials themselves, and also the ability to, to optimize it. So you can really put the reinforcement fibers exactly where they're needed to make the structure as stiff and light as possible. You also have the ability to form curved shapes. So by molding the structure, we can form pretty much any shape we want. And the materials are very highly resistant to environmental degradation. So they're very resistant to, to corrosion. They, in gen, most general atmospheric conditions, they can survive very well. And my background is in the marine industry as well. I came into the, these materials through, through an interest in boats. And uh, when I started my career, my mentor at the time told me that, uh, that the most interesting projects he'd ever been involved in were the ones that involved architects. I didn't pay much attention at the time because I was, I was young and I, I was really loved boats and that's what I was really interested in doing. And I was very fortunate to work on a number of marine projects and actually managed to achieve one of my childhood dreams when I worked on the Swedish America's Cup project in, for the Cup in 2007 in Valencia. When I came to the end of this, I sort of wondered you know, what I was going to do to top this. Um, it was difficult to see where I'd go from here, but little did I realise I was about to discover the wisdom of my mentor's words um, as I started getting involved in architectural projects. And that pretty much coincided with when I first met Gabby. That was a very uh, quick intro. Um, hi everyone for joining. I just correct my name. My name is Gabi Böhm. I said it in the proper German way now, sorry Mark. Um, I'm the principal architect at PCT. Um, and I come from a, um, a very different background. I come from a family of architects who work pr primarily actually with concrete. So really heavy materials. I learned about composite materials during an internship I did at Speedwave in South Germany. This was in um, 1990 before I went uh, to study architecture in Munich. Speedwave was specialized in lightweight solutions, uh, mainly for the marine industry. They so built uh, basically sailing, sailing boats and a lot of components for, for the America's Cup. So there's a, a kind of a parallel. Um, the owners um, nevertheless extended their portfolio in the end 80s into architecture after they met uh, Dr. Bodo Rush, who is a master student of Fry Otto. Dr. Rush drove by the factory, it's actually a really nice story, 
and saw a bow tile leaning uh, against the factory walls and it just reminded him of a slice of a dome. And he dropped in and he said, guys, you can build sailing boats in this size. Can you also actually build uh, components for, for domes? And the owner said, yes, of course, why not? And this idea then was used uh, for the Prophet's uh, mosque in Medina, um, where we actually um, built uh, 24 domes with a diameter of 27 meters uh, in a, in the, at, the end of, at the end of the 80s. Uh, I think the installation went on until around 94. Those domes are now over 30 years in service, and this uh, is, uh, I think, a very good proof for the durability and longevity of composite materials in general. I think there's another slide. Yeah. Uh, you can see here the, uh, the domes basically uh, in different opening stages. So those domes uh, open and close every day once in the evening to just um, allow for natural ventilation of the, of the interior of the, of the uh, praying rooms. I think I give the word back to you again, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> You're next. So one of, when, uh, one of the first projects I was involved in after the cup was the Mecca clock tower in Saudi. And this was a, a building which is right next to the Prophet's Mosque in Mecca. At the time it was built, it was the second tallest in the building in the world at about 607 meters tall. And the top 200 meters of the tower from the sort of uh, the media wall um, upwards, including the clock itself, the dome, the jewel, the spire and the crescent on the top were all clad in FRP composite materials. So it's about uh, 60,000 square meters of composites in total, spread over around 200 meters height. Uh, they were chosen, the reason for choosing the composite materials on here was for a number of reasons. One was due to the weight of the structure because the building as originally designed didn't have the clock and the jewel and the spire on top of it. It had quite a simple ornament on the top of the building. But as they were going through the design, they decided to, to add the clock and a museum and a center for studying astronomy on the top of the building. And this resulted in quite a big increase in the size of the building, which happened after the foundations had been started to build. So there's quite a strict limit on how much weight they could put up there. And by making the cladding an FRP, it was at about probably 20 to 30 percent of the weight of a traditional GRC cladding system. So this also had a knock-on effect because it allowed a lighter substructure and a lighter main structure, which was beneficial to the, the weight target of the structure. It was also quite a complicated facade. There was a lot of 3D um, molding and the calligraphy and the decoration around the clock tower. And this was easy to realize with the molded FRP composites. And finally, it was finished with uh, mosaic tiles. So the entire facade is covered with mosaic tiles, sort of ceramic and glass tiles, about 20, 20 mil by 20 mil, very similar to what you put in a bathroom except there are around 70 million of them on this facade structure. Pretty much all of them applied by hand by a team of tilers that came in to do that, but the bonding of the tiles to the composite is done by an epoxy adhesive grout. And because you're bonding to an epoxy substrate, you get extremely good adhesion there and a very durable finish. The majority of the facade is made up of glass reinforced panels. Um, so these are glass reinforced sandwich structures which are made on large scale molds. And another one of the advantages of having a lightweight panel is not only the reduction in dead weight to the building, but it also allows us to install very large pieces at, at one time and manufacture large pieces. And this is very useful because it allows you to do quick installation, which can be very important for projects, particularly when you come to the facade and the final structure, often you're at the end of the project and there's a lot of pressure on the time. So being able to install quickly and rapidly on site is a big advantage. And the parts are made are molded. So in order to make the part, first we have to make a mold. And in this case, we were using CNC machines to, to cut the molds. Um, this is a part of a mold for the decoration which runs around the outside of the clock face. These parts were manufactured using a wet lamination process. So this is where you take a wet resin system and you combine it with the, the dry fabric in the mold itself. We are using a specific fire retardant resin system which was developed for the project, which uh, due to the fire retardant uh, additives in the resin is, is a relatively thick resin mixture. So in order to ensure a good wet out, so a, a good amount of resin going into the fibers and make sure it's consolidated in the fibers, we used a wet out machine, which is shown here, where you have a bath of resin and the fabric is passed through the resin to pre-impregnate the resin into the fabric. These parts are then laid up into the mold and the mold is then cured in an oven 
at about 50 degrees C in this case. The parts then come out and they're trimmed and finished and this involved putting the tiling on and uh, the tiling detailing was quite incredible on the project and around about a third of the, the tiles on the project were gold tiles. Now in order to get the right colour and longevity of the finish they're actually manufactured with 24 karat gold leaf pressed between two pieces of glass. Now this was done by a company in Italy who have been traditional manufacturers of the, the gold mosaic tiles um, and these have always been made handmade in the past. However, when they got an order for about uh, 30 million tiles, they had to come up with a different manufacturing process for it. They actually developed an entirely new automated process to manufacture the gold tiles for this project. And as with a lot of the projects we work on here, it's sometimes very difficult to get a, a feeling for the scale of it. We know that the projects are big, but every time they're on a computer screen, they're only ever as big as your screen. And it wasn't until we actually started getting the installation that you got a real feel for the scale of what we were building. So this is the first clock face which was installed on the building. And it's only when you highlight the people in the picture that you start getting an idea of just how big the structure was and just how complicated the facade was and how many parts that had to come together to build it. And although the majority of the facade was built with a glass reinforcement, one particular area had to have a slightly more advanced technology. And this was the clock hand. Now the clocks are the largest clocks in the world at about 20 meter diameter. So of course the clock hands are the largest clock hands in the world. The minute hand was about uh, 18 meters long. And in order to get a, a strong light and stiff structure to enable it to be driven from a, a central hub, we actually made the clock hands out of carbon fiber pre break so these are very similar materials that are used for the, the large wind turbine blades today. And this is slightly different to the construction of the facade where we have a pre-impregnated material. So it has the resin and the fiber pre-combined by the material supplier. And these are laid up into a mold and actually cured at about 100 degrees to get a very lightweight stiff structure. And in terms of the structural side of the facade, one of the most interesting bits was the crescent at the top. Now initially this started off with a similar design to the, the main facade where it was a, a glass reinforced sandwich structure with a steel internal structure inside it. However, during the design development there was a, a sort of decision made that they could make better use of the crescent. And there was a request to actually open it up and create a, some internal spaces. So there was some prayer rooms and MEP space inside of the crescent. And in order to do this, to gain enough space inside, it required removal of all the steel structure. So we changed the structural concept here and we actually made the crescent as a structural shell. So very similar to how we'd make a boat with a, a shell structure on the outside with internal bulkheads and frames to support it. And we actually changed the material as well to being a hybrid carbon glass material rather than the pure glass one. And this is now just fixed to the main structure at two points where the neck of the structure comes up inside it. So the crescent itself is about 20 meters uh, diameter and when you unroll it, it's about 70 meters long. So it's very similar in size to a, a large scale boat, which are built in FRP. However, there was one additional challenge here. Because the crescent was being manufactured in Dubai, and road transported to Saudi, we actually had to manufacture it in 13 different pieces for transport. And these pieces were taken to site and pre-assembled into five parts, which were then lifted into place. We couldn't lift the crescent in one piece because the tower top crane was right at the limit of its reach and uh, weight, so it couldn't lift the entire thing in one go. So we designed a set of bolted connections, which had to be done, uh, connected 600 meters up in the air when the park was assembled. And there was a little bit of uh, concern over uh, making sure this would work. So we actually did a full pre-assembly of the Crescent on the ground level in PCT. So we had the top six meters of steel from the building, were diverted from uh, the manufacturer in Turkey and shipped to Dubai, where they were installed in the car park outside Premier Composites. And we started pre-assembling the structure, put the parts together and make sure that everything fitted and would go together well. And we actually managed to do a, a load test on the structure when it was finished in the end as well. One of the other advantages we had in doing this is it allowed us to effectively tile the joints of the, the part when it was assembled together and this was allowed us to ensure that the joint lines in the tiles were continuous across the, the joints and the, this was part of the symptomatic level of detail that went into in defining the, the project and making sure the finish was as good as it possibly could be. Then we finally took the parts to site and the installation started at the top of the building and the 13 parts were lifted up to a, a platform level just below the clock where they were pre-assembled into the five pieces 
and then lifted into place. And it was a very tight, uh, tight lift to get them to avoid them going in. It was a very close thing, very hard work for the installation team. And PCD are fortunate that we have a team of about 200 guys who specialize in installing FRP composite structures. So not only can we design and build the part, but we can also be involved in installation, which is very important when you're dealing with FRP structures on site. And here you can see the final pieces going in and two of the very brave members of the team doing the, the final grouting lines of the tips of the crescent before it was completed. It was quite an amazing structure and uh, like all these things, when it's finished, it looks very simple and it uh, hides a lot of the complexity that's inside there. And after the clock tower, we moved on to a, a number of other projects. And uh, once again, having thought that we could never top what we'd done, we came up with one which was even better, I think, Gary. <laughs> this was the yeah, cool. Steve Jobs Theatre <laughs> lobby roof. And in a similar way to the Crescent, this actually started off uh, the initial design concept for this was uh, was for a steel structure. So it was a, a very highly optimized steel structure with a carbon fiber cladding over the top. And we were asked if we could we could build the cladding of the structure and we thought yes we certainly could. But looking at it we thought this was really not not taking full advantage of the materials and uh, there was a real chance to do do something a bit better with the structure here. Um, because once you put the the carbon fiber shell in there you've got that there, you might as well use it as part of the structure. And it seemed obvious to us that we could make this a lot simpler um, by reducing the amount of different materials and the amount of parts in there and uh, converting it to a pure carbon fiber structure. And this allowed us to really simplify the, the, the roof. So rather than having a, a sort of very complex multiple part steel and then about a, I think there was about something in the region of four or 500 cladding panels on it, wasn't there Gary? Initially, we yeah. took this and converted it into a, a structure where we actually made it out of 45 parts. So we had a about a four meter diameter central hub, which sat in the middle, and then 44 slices, which went around and fitted together. And the slices were effectively formed out of the sandwich shell panel on the top, which formed a, a membrane shell structure. And then we used the, uh, the webs at the side of each panel to form stiffeners underneath. So we had a series of, effectively a series of beams with a continuous shell over the top. And this gave us a number of advantages. It reduced the number of parts. It uh, reduced the weight. Now, at the time, the weight wasn't a real um, critical factor. They managed to optimize the steel structure enough to get it down to the, the weight target for the glass. Um, by changing to carbon, we, we reduced the structural weight from about, uh, total structural weight from about uh, 78 tons down to about 36 tons. So it was quite a big saving there. At the time that wasn't critical, it was all an advantage because it's sitting on the glass and it's a seismic zone, so reduction of the weight reduces the loads in the glass. Um, but actually later in the, on in the project it turned out to be a, a very useful thing because the internal ceiling was a suspended ceiling, a stainless steel um, double curved um, perforated ceiling structure. And quite late on in the project, after the roof had been built, uh, it turned out that after trials, they had to increase the thickness of the stainless steel ceiling and uh, they doubled the weight of it. And that added an extra around about 30 tons to the structure. Now we were able to accommodate that because we'd saved quite a lot of structural weight in the roof. However, if they'd gone down the original design with the steel structure, the additional weight of the ceiling would have then overloaded the glass. So this weight saving actually turned out to be quite a big benefit in the end. And the connection was quite simple. The roof is supported by the glass. So we actually had one connection per panel onto a bracket, which fixed to a bracket on the top of the glass header. So 44 connections in total around the roof. And each of the segments was bolted to the central hub using a detail, which, which borrowed technology from the marine industry. So we used a, a bolted connection detail, which used a tray laminate and a backing plate, very similar to the way that we bolt uh, keel structures to boats. And the parts were made out of a uh, sprint material. So this is uh, again a pre-preg style material where we have a, we effectively buy a fabric with a catalyzed resin film incorporated into it. These are laid up into a mold. They're cured in an oven overnight at a at 100 degrees C. So we end up with a very, very rigid, very stable structure that comes out. And we also, a fully carbon structure is very stable under temperature. So the thermal expansion is very low, which was quite important for us, both in terms of reducing the amount that the roof moved when it was sat on top of the glass, but also ensuring that we had very accurate parts because one of the 
the things we were using the roof for is not only as a structure and an aesthetic finish, but also as the waterproofing of the building. So this formed the building envelope. So it's very important we have very accurate panels. So we had tight joints so that we could avoid any risk of any uh, water leakage in the structure. And the parts were pre-assembled much the same way as we did with the Crescent. We pre-assembled the parts in Dubai. So we had an assembly jig, we put the panels all together, checked that everything fitted, did a load test on the structure. And then once that was done, the, the parts were taken to pieces, painted, packed, and then they were shipped over to California in some fairly impressive sized, uh, impressive sized containers, which went on a ship over there. And I'll hand over to Gabby for the story in Cupertino. You're talking very well. <laughs> um, what happened in the meantime, actually, while we were building the segments, we actually uh, were sitting at the Freen and Ripe office one afternoon, I remember. It was actually in the early design phase. And uh, we looked at the, um, the way how, how to bring the roof together. And uh, we were just sitting there and saying, yeah, why don't we uh, just uh, pre-assemble or we have put the, the roof together right next to the, the glass ring and then uh, lift it up um, in one piece. Uh, this would uh, help to save um, a lot of uh, equipment, uh, hydraulic platform above the grass ri glass ring. It would also, of course, limit the risk uh, to damage the the glass uh, uh, panels, uh, which were very large and very unique at the time. Um, and we said, yeah, let's do that. Um, looking again at a very small screen with a very small roof um, I think we just uh, on the screen. A little bit of paper, didn't we, Gabby? It was just like a yeah, yeah. circle, and boop, <laughs> drop it off. <laughs> Easy. Exactly. So uh, once those beautiful panels arrived in, uh, in Cupertino, um, I think it's the next slide now, we were setting them up on a pre-assembly chip which we used already in Dubai. So this was recycled uh, already. You can see here the, the big slices coming together. Uh, on the right side, basically already the, the glass ring installation going on. This is, uh, again, um, a very good uh, uh, time saving for the client, but also cost saving because uh, usually uh, uh, construction um, uh, in some countries is very costly. So this helped us really to, uh, to save uh, months, months of, con of, of installation uh, on site. Uh, the, the roof disc was put together in uh, four and a half weeks, as far as I remember. Um, and then once the roof was finished, I think we go to the next slide, we were literally uh, fixing it to, uh, to a steel frame, which was attached only in eight points to the center hub of the roof. Um, and then um, we were literally ready for the, for the big hoist. Um, the day was beautiful. It couldn't be any better uh, in, 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 uh, in Silicon Valley. We had zero wind, the sun was shining. Yeah. Um, we looked at the, uh, the disc on the hook, Mark and myself standing right uh, <laughs> at the edge uh, from this point of angle. And we thought, what, what did we do? <laughs> so <laughs> it was just a gigantic uh, operation. Um, as you can see, the, the, the roof lifted off the steel uh, chick and then was literally flying through the air. Uh, with the crane even even moving back, I think around 300 meters, with the roof hooked to it, yeah. uh, and then was literally exposing. If you go to the next slide, the full gravity of that roof uh, just before we uh, dropped it. You can see on this uh, uh, image very well also the um, sort of the uh, uh, areas of the roof, the inside areas of the roof, which are which are already uh, um, finished with uh, um, aluminium foiled. Um, um, insulation, thermal in insulation, but you can also see already uh, most of the MEP equipment uh, being um, suspended and attached uh, to the roof. Um, the, um, the advantage of this kind of uh, uh, pre-assembly uh, away from the actual location is that you can access uh, all the areas easily, uh, which was again a big uh, um, gain in time overall. Yeah. Then the roof was literally placed on a, on a check system and lowered down uh, onto the glass ring. Uh, the operation took place within two and a half uh, hours and it was incredibly impressive. Mm -hmm. um, after the interior ceiling was uh, uh, completed, it exposed actually the beauty of the design. 
of an entirely um, column-free space um, where you have to think what is happening there. Actually, how does it work? How does it work? Magic. Uh, it's really one of the most uh, beautiful projects I have personally worked on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a, an amazing structure, and it was, uh, I think, uh, like all these things, when you when you start off and uh, you kind of have the idea of and pushing it through, and we actually looked at the, the design. Everything is always only ever the size of a piece of paper. And then when you see it in full life and installed, it's, a, it's quite an incredible structure, very beautiful thing. And as always, the simplicity hides an awful lot of complexity <laughs> behind it. Yeah, yes, very true. We also get involved in, in some smaller structures and these again are, are ones that are built in Dubai. So Gabby will give you a quick run through. Uh, I think these, these came to us uh, initially as a very short timescale project, wasn't it Gabby? With, uh, Yes, we had, uh, we had actually uh, seven weeks uh, time to build the first set of three shelters. The uh, shelter pro project was um, actually developed uh, with EMA and uh, the landscaping architects SWA from Los Angeles. They designed uh, those uh, structures to uh, be positioned along the, um, the waterfront at the Dubai um, Creek Harbor, which is a new development in Dubai, a high-end development. Um, the client received um, very poor samples in terms of, uh, of, of, of quality. And uh, we were approached if we could uh, not propose a material which looked like uh, the finish of a boat. Mm -hmm. um, we built a small mock-up which was very well received and we got the contract very quickly and had literally seven weeks to build, um, to build those three first pieces. Um, the installation on site would have been really difficult uh, because people were already moving into this area, into the high-rise high, high buildings. Um, therefore, we uh, developed actually the possibility to build that unit fully um, uh, finished at PCT and uh, bring it to site as one piece. Uh, here you see the initial model, um, which already shows uh, a very bespoke, uh, curved, uh, three-dimensional shape. I think they did look into doing it in concrete as well, didn't they? But they would have had to build a full formwork on site and pour on site. Yeah. It would have been a, a very exactly. disruptive thing. Yeah, and they wanted them really quickly. Um, mm -hmm. There was a deadline for end of the year and to present them. So we, uh, we had to work really quick on this one. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one of Mark's uh, great uh, sketches. Uh, the shelter was actually... Uh, because it was even too big to be built in one piece. Uh, 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 we literally split it down into four um, parts, which were then joined together to two halves first uh, and pre-finished and then assembled together to form uh, the, the actual shelter uh, at PCT. Um, they are already pre-finished. As you can see, you see already the white high gloss uh, shiny finish on them. But we joined then the other half, uh, we laminated over the joint line and then finished only those uh, strips. Um, so we had uh, literally a production line um, set up here and uh, managed to, uh, to actually complete the three quite large units uh, within the seven weeks uh, given. Um, the size of those uh, pieces, uh, I think they are around uh, 5.8 meters tall at the front end, around 4 meters at the back end. And the length was, I think, uh, roughly around 6 meters, as I remember. Yeah. Um, we had to shrink them a little bit to make them uh, transportable. They had to still uh, sort of fit on a, on a truck and underneath the bridges. Um, this shows the loading concept. Um, they were slightly uh, 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 rotated basically um, uh, on the truck and then they were brought down to, to site. Um, if you go to the next slide, they were literally just hooked um, off, the, um, off the truck and then flown into position on the concrete platforms right by the waterfront. Uh, we were able to install uh, this uh, uh, combination of three pieces basically within three days. There was also no more finish on site required. They were literally 100% factory finished. A really nice example, um, I think, of, of self-supportive shades uh, um, 
which uh, show you that the molded materials allow you also absolute freedom in, in design and, 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 and shape and geometries. I remember when, when we installed the first prototypes, there was a, a point where I think one of the, the client's representatives was questioning whether they'd ever be used as shea structures, whether they yes, they true. work. And uh, then they went down to the site visit to go and look at the shelters. And all the guys that were working on doing the landscaping around it were all having their lunch, sat in the shade of the shelters. Of course. <laughs> it was just a perfect example. No, they are very, not only do they look beautiful, but they, they function as well. Yes, they are very uh, well uh, received by the uh, by the people down there. Uh, I'm I'm down there regularly, and uh, I mean they look stunning. I have to say because they really have this marine uh, uh, kind of finish. Um, but it's also one of the the top uh, uh, motives for for selfies. I have yeah. to say, so you find this a lot on social media. So it's a. Uh... An interesting group of projects. I think certainly when I <laughs> when I started out coming into this, what are we now, sort of 12, 13 years ago, I really wasn't expecting uh, <laughs> expecting the type of projects that would come up and how interesting this would be. And uh, sometimes it's interesting to look at it and think, you know, there's such advantage you have in a project in these materials. Why aren't they used so much? And I was talking to someone a while ago and I said, it, sometimes it feels a bit like the pioneers. So the old uh, guys going out to the West, it's it's actually a very hard journey to get there, not because the materials are difficult or because there's any inherent difficulty in designing it, it's just they're not familiar materials in, in, in the architectural world. So it tends to be quite hard work to get people to understand their cap capabilities. A lot of people think of composites as, as sort of chop strand map things that you yeah. make bathtubs and shower trays out of. And that's yeah. a world away from the materials we're using here. And getting people to understand that and understand their capabilities and the advantages they can bring to the projects can be really hard work. And uh, when you see the final project and it's there and it looks wonderful, it all looks great, but that really hides often a lot of complexity within the structure itself, but also quite a hard journey that we take to get there. But, you know, I'm, re I'm really hopeful that, uh, that we're seeing much more uh, examples of these projects now, much more things to show people what we can do with them and really to demonstrate that, that by using the materials properly, you can really produce some quite, quite inspirational structures. We can really sort of bring people's dreams to life. And if it's done correctly in the right way, it can be in a way that, that's cost effective and can do things that, that you just can't do in other materials. I think a very important point is the repetition uh, uh, when designing uh, for, for this kind of materials. But I think if this is uh, sort of uh, um, respected, this very important factor then uh, we, uh, we uh, can offer very, very uh, cost efficient solutions to projects. And I think we've been, we've been very lucky. I mean, I've been very lucky to be involved in the projects. And I've been very lucky to work with people that, that are very sort of enthusiastic and, and excited by the structures. And you need that to, to get you through some of the, <laughs> the hard times you face in the project. Yeah. And we've been lucky to work with some, some really good clients who've been really keen to, to use this and, and explore it and demonstrate what can be done with it. And I think, uh, I think if nothing else, it's certainly, um, certainly brought home to me the wisdom of those words I was told many years ago when I started out. And I think it's probably true. I, I do love boats, but I think the most interesting projects I've been involved in are the ones that have involved architects. <laughs> and I think it doesn't sometimes really matter. Uh, what you build, uh, you're using the materials you are, you are comfortable with and you're experienced with. So I think the, uh, the architectural projects also are a lot more visible than many of the sailing boats you have engineered. Um, and um, I agree, uh, we have been uh, very fortunate to, to have uh, worked with uh, really adventurous, I say sometimes, uh, clients and architects uh, worldwide. Um, and, and we're able to, uh, to literally deliver this uh, beautiful projects. Yeah. Well, thanks Great. very much everyone for, for listening in. I hope, I hope this was a useful talk and maybe giving you a little bit of inspiration. And, you know, we're always interested in, in sort of finding new uses for the materials and pushing things. So if you've got something you think could benefit from composites, then get in touch. What comes next? <laughs> exactly. What comes next? Yes. <laughs> We're always on the lookout for the next challenge. <laughs> yes, thanks also from my side. Thanks very much for listening. And uh, yes, stay all safe, please. Super. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.